so good, amen? God is so good. He is just so good. He is beyond words. And you're, the only way you're going to find out about it is if you spend time with Him. Spend time in the Word and spend time in prayer. It's the only way you're going to find out just how truly awesome He is. I have to be obedient to, to Jesus. And He wants me to preach on a, a message that not a lot of people really know about or really spend a whole lot of time in. And when, when the subject even comes up, it causes a lot of, um, a lot of misunderstandings. But Jesus told me to speak on it, and by the, by the Holy Spirit, that's what I'm going to do. Because I have to be obedient to what my Lord and Savior says. Amen. And the, the subject is the fear of the Lord. Now, immediately, some people are saying, the fear of the Lord, but Jesus has given us a power, love, a sound mind. Well, that's true. But the fear of the Lord is something a little bit different. One, it's godly fear. And I'll get into all that in a little bit. But i got to... Jesus wants me to do some teaching on this by the revelation that he has given me and the study that he has told me to do. And from there, it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit's ball game. I mean, whatever he wants to do is fine with me. So, Heavenly Father, I come before you today just wanting to do your will. Father God, let your will be done here, right now, on earth, as it is in heaven. Father God, I'm going to trust that you are going to teach the, the people that, you're, that I am just standing here, but it's going to be your, your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding, your guidance that's going to be infused into the people. Father God, have your way with my body, have your way with my mouth, have your way with my heart and my hands, have your way with this service, Lord. We thank you, Lord God, and we know that you're going to do something great. Don't know what it is, but we know it's going to be good. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel very humbled and very honored to be speaking today and tomorrow on the one year anniversary where we started to go three services a day, every day. And I don't, God is really not a, there's, there's no coincidences with God. It's, it's all by his divine will. And um, I didn't even, I didn't even look ahead in the calendar and I immediately asked him, all right, what do you want me to speak on next? And he gave me the fear of the Lord. I was like, okay. So, and, um, you know, I've been doing pretty much studying on it ever since. The fear of the Lord. If you have your Bible, please turn to Psalm 34, verses 8 and 9. Thank you, Jesus. You're just so awesome. Verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. There is no want. Fear the Lord, you his saints, there is no want or lack to those who fear him. Fear the Lord is all throughout the Old and New Testament. There's a, there's a movement out there that's saying the fear of the Lord is Old Testament and the love of the Lord is New Testament. 
well, Jesus, if that was true, then Jesus would never have spoken on the fear of the Lord, but he did. I'll, sh I'll share that with you in a little bit. But I saw that there's no fear the Lord, you his saints. What does fear mean? What does the Hebrew definition and the Greek definition of fear mean? Obviously, the most common definition is to be utterly terrified of something like spiders or bees. Now, I can relate with that. Sometimes spiders send a chill up my spine, but I don't fear spiders. In the Hebrew, and this is taken straight out of the Strong's Book of Concordance, the Hebrew and I apologize if I butcher this pronunciation. The spelling is Y-A-R-E. And it's pronounced yaw re The definition is to fear, revere, or be afraid. To fear and be afraid. You know, we, we all, we're all afraid of, we all become afraid of something every now and again as much as we try not to, as much as we try not to. I like the next definition, the next two. To stand in awe or be awed. So if you fear the Lord, you're standing in awe of him. You're just like, stops you dead in it, and dead in your tracks. <gasps> oh my goodness. Third definition, to fear, reverence, honor, or respect. See, a lot of people are, have the fear of the Lord and they just don't, don't admit it or they don't know exactly what it is. So I was looking at, that, at those definitions and I thought to myself, what does reverence mean? So I looked that up too. And essentially, reverence, and reverence is all throughout the Old and New Testament. All through it. All through it. Reverence means, by dictionary.com, reverence means a feeling or attitude of deep respect mixed with awe. So when we're talking about the fear of the Lord, we're talking about respect. We're talking about awe. We're talking about honor. And we're talking about astonishment. I mean, it's, it's one thing to know what it is, and it's another thing entirely to do it. I'm going to give an example here. When people are driving down the road and the speed limit says 45 miles an hour, most people do not travel 80 miles an hour in that area. Why? Well, because we know the consequences. We could lose control of the car. We could hit somebody. We could hit something. There may be a, you know, a deer whatever may be crossing the road and we won't have time to get out of the way. And what that is, is that a respect for the law of the land, a respect for the speed limit says 45, I will obey that speed limit. I mean, you could, if you go over that excessively, you could hurt yourself, you could hurt or kill your family you could hurt or kill somebody else while you survive, and you'll have to live with that the rest of your life. In much the same way that some people disregard the speed limit, people in general, and to some extent the church, are disregarding the law of the Lord. They have no, they read it, 
but they don't implement it into their lives. They don't take the practicality of the Word of God and try to walk it. They don't treat others the way that God wants them to treat. They don't treat others the way they want them to treat you. They just don't do it. They don't have love for everybody else, just in general. And I'm also here to deliver a warning that people who continue to blatantly walk against the will of God, judgment is hanging over you. And it's not the kind of judgment that you're just going to get a slap on the wrist, that you're just going to get thrown into jail. It's the kind of judgment that you're going to be burned for eternity in the depths of hell, where there is no love, there is no hope. You're there forever. And I warn you, consider your ways before it's too late. Consider what you're doing before it's too late, before God judges you. Consider your ways. Church, I love and respect the church, but please stop pointing fingers. Please stop pointing fingers to other people and say, I be I'm better than them because you're comparing yourself to one another. And God has warned not to do that. Because God says, aren't my ways higher than your ways? Aren't my thoughts higher than your thoughts? Follow God. Repent. Follow God. We as a church are called to love people but hate the sin. And that's, that's whatever sin it may be. Stealing, killing, destroying, whatever sin. Even people that use their own bodies in perverse ways, like using drugs, like even the church going homosexuals, once again, I have to be obedient to what Jesus has told me to do. And to everybody who, who I just offended, keep in mind that we love you, but you need to turn from your ways. Consider what you're doing. And consider where it may lead. Jesus spoke on the fear of the Lord. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And keep in mind that even though I am standing up here warning you, I also hold myself accountable for what I do. I am not perfect. I make mistakes. Sometimes other people, like my wife, those closest around me, point my mistakes out to me. And then that's when I seek forgiveness. But if I know I'm doing something wrong, I seek forgiveness immediately. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. It is a terrible thing to fall in the hands of an angry God and blatant, unrepentant sin is going to get you landed in that position. 
please consider what you're doing. Please take inventory of your life and ask Jesus if we are missing the mark. For, for example, if I am missing the mark anywhere, then I ask Jesus to show me where I'm missing it. And I, I encourage you, each one of you, each one of you to do the same thing. Jesus also, Jesus said the same thing in Luke chapter 12, verse 5. Don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Fear him. Fear who? Fear God the Father. Some of you may be asking, how do I get, how do I get the fear of the Lord, or how do I know that I got it already? Well, you know you have it already that if, that if you knowingly do something that's against the Word of God and you just don't feel quite right about it, that's God convicting you. You have the fear of the Lord and repent of what you just did. Happens to me. But in James chapter 4, verse 2, it says, "If Ask for wisdom, and he gives it to you. You have not because you ask not. James chapter 4, verse 2, You have not because you ask not. You do not have something because you have not asked for it. But what does God want you to ask for? He wants you to ask for stuff that's going to build your character to serve Him. The fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, all of those. If you ask for wisdom, what does He give you? According to... The Bible, if you ask for wisdom, he gives you the fear of the Lord. I'm going to give you three places where it says that. If you want to write them down, go right ahead. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And Psalm one eleven, verse ten. All three of those says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All throughout the Bible we see people demonstrating the fear of the Lord. Solomon, when he prayed, when he asked for wisdom when he prayed at the dedication of the temple. Most notably, Mary. This is right after Gabriel said that you will conceive. She went to Elizabeth, her cousin, and sang a song. Luke chapter 1, verse 50, is Mary given respect and love and devotion to God for what he has done. Now, why talk about this? Why talk about this? It's important. It's extremely important. Also, as a note, I, earlier I gave you, gave you the definition of fear in Hebrew. In Greek, fear is translated in the New Testament. It's translated as phobio. Same root word we get phobia from. But the fear of the Lord is extremely important. 
because in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Work out your own salvation with love and joy. No, it doesn't say that. Work out your own salvation with tolerance and acceptance. No, it doesn't say that either. What it really says is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Why, do, why are we going to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling? Because I thought serving Jesus is the most fantastic thing ever. It is. But, just because someone walks with Jesus, somebody talks with Jesus, doesn't mean that their heart is right with Jesus. Need an example? All right. Judas Iscariot walked with Jesus while he was on the earth. He was called as one of the apostles, but he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Then he went out and hung himself. Don't think for a minute that just because you have the joy of the Lord, just because you have the fear of the Lord, that you're good to go. Don't think that for a minute. Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. We will have tests. We will have trials. We will have temptations. But the degree that you have the fear of the Lord in your heart and the love of the Lord in your heart is to the degree that you will have victory over the trials, over the tests, over the temptations. The more fear, the more love that you have for Jesus, the more victory you're going to have. And the more Jesus is going to be able to use you to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Doesn't everybody want to be used by Jesus like that? Of course you do. Of course you do. So once again I say, consider your ways. Consider what you're doing. Is what you're doing pleasing to God? Is it? I can't answer that for you. Go to the one who can. His name is Jesus. He can tell you. He can tell you if what you're doing is right with him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're just so awesome. Let's go to Hebrews. Let's spend some time in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. I mean, there is just so much about this subject. And the Bible clearly distincts the difference between the fear of God and the fear of man and everything else. Doesn't Jesus say, it is I? <laughs> Once again, I say, consider your ways. So does the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things, say all things, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give account. God sees everything. God sees what you're doing at night. He sees what we're doing behind closed doors. He sees these things.
he sees them. All things. That's why we must continuously, continuously read the Word of God. Pray. So that we know what we are doing that's against the will of God. And it's different for everybody. We all have different walks. We all have different testimonies about how we came to Jesus. So if we got to give an account to God the Father for all things that we've done, You know, everybody knows their own past. Who's going to save us from the wrath that we so richly deserve? His name is Jesus. He bore your sins on the cross. He took the transgressions that we have done on the cross when He died for us. Do you accept it? People, some people may say yes. God says prove it. Prove it. He says that to me too. Prove it. Prove that you love God. Jesus already proved that he loved us when he died for us. He already proved it. Now it's our turn to prove it to him. Skip over to Hebrews chapter 10. And prove. There we go. Chapter 10, verse 26. Once we accept what Jesus has done, he commands us to live a certain way. He commands us to do certain things. And it's... He has his reasons. But the vast majority is found in the Bible. He'll tell you to do specific things. But the Bible tells us to do lifestyle changes. Don't steal, for one. Don't lie. Don't kill. Don't want what somebody else has. Those are just a few. Chapter 10, verse 26 in Hebrews. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation of which will devour the adversaries. What does that mean? It means that if you sin after hearing about what Jesus has done for you, he can't protect you from the fiery pits of hell. And that if you, when you hear the knowledge of the truth and you still continue to sin, Expect judgment. Don't know when. Might be immediately. Might be 20, 30, 80 years from that point. I don't know. But there is hope. It's called repentance. Every so often we fail. Because, after all, let's face it, we are flesh and blood. But thank the Lord, by His grace, He keeps us on the earth so that we can repent for what we have done. Hallelujah. I'm just trying to enlighten 
everybody about what happens if you have us unconfessed sin in your life. Verse 28, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as a common thing, and insult the Spirit of Grace. Rich, you're coming on pretty strong. Thank you. I'd much rather talk about love. I'd much rather talk about healing. I'd much rather encourage you. But God has told me to warn you. Times are going to get just flat out crazier than they already are. And if you are not rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ, you're going to fall. We need to continuously seek Jesus in all that we do, all that we say, and even all we think. That might be a little tough for some people, but start with what you do and what you say. Start there. But verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Why? Well, Jesus said, because he can destroy both body and soul in hell. If, no, if, if you want to know what hell is like, read the Bible, especially in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus describes it as where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. It's a lake of fire. Has anybody been burned in their life? It hurts. And that's, that's just a little, you know, sunburn, something, matches, trying to start a campfire, whatever. It hurts. Can you imagine? You know, eventually that burn will go away. Can you imagine? Suppose that if you, if, 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 you get plunged into hell your whole body is immediately on fire and that pain never goes away. That is not something I want to suffer. So I am, that's, that's why, that's why, that's why I continuously check myself and I encourage everybody to do the same thing. Check yourself check myself and make sure what we're doing is pleasing to God. We are, but know that we're going, every so often, we're going to miss the mark. Once again, we're human. But that's where repentance and grace comes in. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. God, you're so good. You are so good, Lord God. And all the time, God is good. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. May we serve God acceptably with 
reverence and godly fear. Remember reverence, the feeling or attitude of deep respect mixed with awe. You know, people, generally people don't want to disobey the law because they'll get arrested and thrown in jail. They have a respect for policemen and what they stand for. They have a respect of judges and what they can, what sentences they can bring down on people. Let me just say, even though judges bring sentences down on people, how much more will Jesus judge those who willfully disobey what he has done, what he has commanded, what he has rejected? How much more will Jesus reject those who rejected what Jesus did on the cross? Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Some people are saying, what can we do? What can we do? I encourage everybody here and everybody watching, if you have questions, seek the one who gives answers liberally to those who ask, and his name is Jesus. He can answer your questions for you. Everywhere he went, people called him rabbi. It means teacher. So church, I encourage every Bible-believing Christian the bride of Christ to make yourself ready because the groom is coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Make yourself ready. Get to know the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Get to know him. Time is running out. And we are not even guaranteed tonight, let alone when we're on our deathbed. And if we die with unrepentant sin in our life, sorry, time's up. And if anybody feels the pull of God leading to repentance for what they have done. Wherever you are, kneel down and pray for forgiveness with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How easily can we lose our own salvation because we don't fear and don't respect what God has done? How easy is it for us to lose such things? I mean, in this world, there's all kinds of stuff to try and take your attention away from Jesus. All kinds. Hold steadfast to what Jesus has done for you. Hold steadfast to pursue in Jesus with all that you are. Because if you don't, you won't make it. And I'm including myself in that. In closing, I ask you, is everything that you have done pleasing to God? I can't answer that. Only God can. Ask Him. Is everything that you are thinking pleasing to God? Once again, I can't answer that, but God can. Ask Him. 
Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it just takes a deep fear, respect, and adoration to be able to do that. Because once again, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want wisdom, He's going to give you the fear of the Lord. So, I say, consider your ways, for you do not know when you will meet God face to face. And I pray that you are ready. You are you are without spot or wrinkle. Heavenly Father, Father God, I pray for those who, ha who you are tugging to repent, to seek you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray for those, Lord, that you will give them strength and encouragement as they seek you and as they work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. I pray for those people, Lord God. I pray for those people, Lord God, that you will manifest yourself to them in a real, tangible way right now. In Jesus' name, these things I pray. Amen. I'm willing to pray for anybody.